With the election fast approaching and coronavirus concerns running high, most states are forging ahead in expanding access to mail-in voting. About one in four votes in the U.S. were cast by mail in 2016. But the numbers this year are expected to be much higher. A state like Wisconsin, which typically gets about 5% of its votes cast by absentee, has reason to anticipate that 50 to 60% of the votes this fall might be cast by absentee ballot. 42 states have opted to let voters vote by mail with no excuse. That includes the six key swing states, Arizona, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. With a combined 101 electoral votes, there's a good chance the path to the White House runs through these six states. So let's break it down. Let's start with North Carolina, where about 5% of voters cast their ballots by mail in 2016. This year, as of mid-August, they've already seen seven times as many absentee ballots requested in North Carolina as the same time in 2016. Other swing states like Michigan and Wisconsin opted to automatically mail absentee ballot requests to every registered voter. Trump has said that practice was done illegally and without authorization by a rogue secretary of state. In the case of Michigan, he's since threatened to pull funding from the state. In the primary, many Michigan voters reported delays in receiving their mail-in ballots. That's led to questions about whether the state will be able to pull it off on a larger scale come November. But when it comes to Florida, President Trump abruptly changed his tune. Why? He says Republicans are in charge. So Florida's got a great Republican governor, and it had a great Republican governor. And over a long period of time, they've been able to get the absentee ballots done extremely professionally. Florida is different from other states. Since 2002, Florida has allowed voters to mail in absentee ballots without needing a reason. More than 1.1 million Republicans voted by mail in Florida in the 2016 election, more than the Democrats, helping Trump win the state. And this year, President Trump has already requested his own absentee ballot in Florida, his current legal residence, presumably to vote for himself. Arizona is another state with a history of voting by mail. About 75% of Arizona voters use mail-in ballots, and they can opt in to what's known as the permanent absentee list, where they automatically get sent a ballot for every election they're eligible to vote in. Other battlegrounds like Pennsylvania haven't had that same experience with mail-in voting, and it's causing some issues. Pennsylvania was overwhelmed in the primary by ballot requests, nearly 17 times more than they saw in 2016. This caused a major headache and major delays in the primary in the 9th Congressional District in Pennsylvania, where it took almost three weeks for the results to be finalized. Wisconsin's also had some trouble. They found three full tubs of absentee ballots in a postal center that never made their way to voters. On top of that, thousands of completed ballots were postmarked too late to count. That's important in a place like Wisconsin. Trump narrowly skated by there in 2016, only winning by about 23,000 votes. Another issue facing mail-in voting is the challenge in fixing ballots that might have an issue that would prevent them from being counted. North Carolina recently ruled the state has to give voters due process and alert them to potential issues ahead of Election Day, a ruling that could prevent about 100,000 ballots from being trashed. Trump only won North Carolina by about 173,000 votes in 2016. So if it's just as close this time around, it could take weeks for the state to be able to report final results. When it comes to mail-in voting, perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind is the deadlines. And there's more than one. Every state has a different cutoff for when ballot requests must be received and then when the actual ballot must be received by the voting precinct in order for it to be counted. So if you want to vote by mail, do your homework. NBCNews.com slash plan your vote has all the information state by state. As a general rule, USPS recommends a minimum of seven days to return a ballot by mail. But now the Postal Service is sounding the alarm that ballots mailed last minute might not make it in time. The USPS writing states across the country to say they can't move mail as fast as states seem to think and urging states to make their deadlines earlier. Americans need to get the message much more than I think they have at this point, um, that if they can vote in person, uh, they should vote in person. It will relieve a lot of stress on the absentee ballot process the more people who can vote in person comfortably. You can always exercise your right to vote in person, either during early voting or on Election Day, November 3rd. 
Make sure you know how to vote in the 2020 presidential election. NBC News is here to help. We have a new state-by-state -state guide called Plan Your Vote. It has information on voting rules, deadlines, and restrictions by state. Check it out at NBCNews.com slash Plan Your Vote. What do you want to hear from the DNC this week? You know, I'm not really looking for particulars on issues because <laughs> I no longer believe a, a politician when they tell me what their priority is. Um, what I am truly listening for is how they are going to reach across the aisle. I'm looking for what they're going to do for the average American, the working class person for health care, you know, this the, the unemployment debacle that's going on right now. How big of a moment is this for, for him to, to really speak to voters like you? It's I, don't, I, I think it's a huge moment, not only for voters like me, but for the American people. I mean, do we want to go with what we've had the last three and a half years, almost four years? Or do we want to, you know, with everything that's going on, do we want to switch gears and and, and see what's going to happen. In 2008, did you vote? I, did, I absolutely voted in 2008. In 2012, yes, did you vote? Yes, proudly. In 2016, did you vote? I did not. You know, I just was not convinced. And not only was I not convinced, but there was nothing that I felt like I could support or kind of like get behind. So what's different for me now is the conversation. At the top of my list and everybody else's list is definitely police reform and police reform in the way of how people are policed. Just that, right? Just, again, opening up the lines for that conversation because it's so polarized right now. And particularly in 2016, the Democrats lost a lot of union support. What happened there and how can they win uh, union voters back? What Trump did very, very well, and I think he should get credit for this, is he spoke to that feeling of being ignored that a lot of people were feeling, I think. I think bringing in uh, his experience, Biden's experience under President Obama is a helpful comparison because you can just do a, probably a 10-point bullet list of all the, th the major things that Trump has done to attack labor and the protections that we have and stack that against what President Obama and Joe Biden were trying to do and did during, the 2000, during his administration. How have you personally been impacted by COVID-19? Well, both of our daughters have had it. Uh, perfectly healthy 30 and 31 year olds um, that came down with it at the end of February. As you watched your two daughters struggle with severe illness, as you watched your community get hit hard by this, what has it been like to watch how this administration has handled this crisis at the same time? It's a kaleidoscope of emotion. And right now I'm actually feeling like I'm gonna tear up. Um, uh, that's a first, because I've gone from frustration, confusion, anger, um, back to frustration so many times that um, I'm uncomfortable with the way I feel right now about the lack of leadership. What can Joe Biden do this week to, to get your vote? Come up with one hell of a plan. One hell of a tax plan, health care plan, and, and a plan for the future. And also come out and, 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 and talk to us. Dasha joins us now from East Grand Rapids, Michigan. Dasha, I loved your socially distant outdoor setup there. That was great. Uh, let's talk about the Democrats. What key groups do they have to sway to flip a place like Kent County? Allison, Kent County has only gone blue once since Lyndon Johnson, and that was in 2008 uh, when Biden was on the ticket with Barack Obama. So uh, the Democratic Party here, uh, the, the head of that party, tells me that they are optimistic. They are cautiously optimistic that they could recreate some of that 2008 magic again. But they are going to have to convince uh, some key demographics, some of which are, are actually traditionally blue voters. I'm talking uh, union workers who may have voted for Trump in 2016 after having voted for Obama or voted the Third party, uh, African American voters who didn't turn out in 2016, like you heard from uh, Lataro Trailer there. Uh, on top of that, they're also going to have to chip 
away at some of the moderate Republican vote in Kent County and in other counties like this. And there is an interesting opportunity there. As you heard, uh, Cynthia Timmerman, uh, the woman who talked about her daughter getting COVID there, uh, she has been a lifelong conservative. She now calls herself a, quote, repulsed Republican because she is so frustrated with the leadership. And voters like her are going to be watching closely this week to really hear the, the platform, hear some actual solutions about how the Democrats plan to heal a country that is deeply wounded right now, Allison. Dasha, how do voters there feel, particularly about uh, how President Trump has handled the coronavirus? How will that affect their vote? It's gotten really personal, Allison, as you heard right there. Uh, Cynthia yeah. saw two of her daughters that are both in their early 30s. They got COVID back in March. They are still uh, in recovery from that. One of her daughters still can't walk up the stairs in her home. Jerry, another one of the voters you heard from there, when I first met him, uh, he was a, a staunchly in Trump's corner. He was uh, very much planning to vote for him again in November. But since then, since he's watched the way the president has handled this pandemic, he has backed away from that support a little bit. He says he wishes there had been a national mask mandate. He wanted the president to, to take this a little bit more seriously. Uh, and then, of course, you have all of the uh, economic impact from this as well that everyone is feeling in, in, uh, in different ways. And so it's, it's hitting home. It's hitting uh, people's pockets. It's hitting people's uh, families. And uh, it's also put health care really in the spotlight. So uh, a lot of the voters I talked to said they, yeah. they want to hear a, a health care plan because they're seeing outrageous bills. Uh, they're, they're hearing from their neighbors, uh, their friends and, and, and uh, neighbors who were hospitalized, who came home to uh, numbers that they that frankly terrified them. So they want to hear uh, a real plan on yeah. health care now more than ever. Health and health care, huge issues in the middle of a pandemic. Dasha Burns in Kent County, Michigan. Great to see you, my friend. You too, Allison. Thank you so much. Stay safe.